Hello friends, I hope you are fine. Today we are going to read chapter 10 of the book that is Certificate Physical and Human Geography written by G.C. Liu. So friend, before starting the chapter, I would like to tell you that all the chapters have been posted on the channel. You can go and check it out. So let us start. Chapter 10 Coastal Landforms The action of waves, tides and currents The coastline under the constant action of the waves, tides and currents is undergoing changes from day to day. On calm days when winds or slight waves do little damage to the shoreline and main steel help to build the beaches and other depositional features. It is in storms that the ravages of the waves reach their greatest magnitude. The average pressure of Atlantic waves on adjacent coasts is about 601 V per square foot in the summer and treble that in winter. During storms, the pressure exerted is more than 6000 LB or 3 tons per square foot. Movements such intensity will wear down not only the cliffs but also sea walls and buildings. Tides and currents on contact with the shores make very little direct attack on the coastline. Tides affect marine erosion mainly by extending a line of erosion into a zone of erosion. This zone corresponds to the area between the low water level and the high water level. Currents help to move eroded debris and deposit it as silt, sand and gravel along the coast. Now the mechanism of marine erosion. The most powerful agents of marine erosion are waves. Their origin is due to the sweeping of winds over the water surface, which sets a series of undulating swells surging forward. These become higher and swifter. A normal wave in an open ocean may measure 20 feet high. The vertical height between the crest and trough and 400 feet long, the wave length or the horizontal distance between one crest and another. During storms, this is greatly increased depending on the speed and duration of the winds. On approaching shallow water near the shores, their speed is reduced and the waves are curved or refracted against the alignment of the coast. Shallow water, when it is less than the height of the waves, checks their forward movement. The crests curl over and break into the shores in a mass of foam as breakers. The water that finally rushes up the beach and hurls rock debris against the land is termed swash. The water is sucked back and retreats as backwash. Another element in offshore drift is the undertow, which flows near the bottom away from the shore. This current exerts a pulling effect which can be dangerous to sea bathers. Marine agents of erosion operate in the following ways to transform the coastal landscape. The first one is corrosion. Waves armed with rock debris of all sizes and shapes charge against the base of the cliffs and wear them back by corrosion. Oncoming currents and tides complete the work by sweeping the eroded material into the sea. The second one is attrition. The constantly moving waves that transport beach materials such as boulders, pebbles, shingle and fine sand also hurl these fragments against one another until they are broken down by attrition into very small pieces. The grinding and polishing of such fragmental materials against cliff faces and against each other is largely responsible for the fine sand which forms the beaches that are so typical of the seaside resorts. The third one is hydraulic action. In their forward surge, waves splashing against the coast may enter joints and crevices in the rocks. The air imprisoned inside is immediately compressed. When the waves retreat, the compressed air expands with explosive violence. Such action repeated again and again soon enlarges the cracks and rock fragments are prized apart. Solvent Action On limestone coasts, the solvent action of seawater on calcium carbonate sets up chemical changes in the rocks and disintegration takes place. This process is limited to limestone coasts. The rate of marine erosion depends on the nature of the rocks, the amount of rock exposed to the sea, the effects of tides and currents and human interference in coast protection. Other effects such as vulcanity, gl glaciation, earth movement and organic accumulations have also to be considered. Now the coastal features of erosion. The first one is capes and bays. On exposed coasts, the continual action of waves on rocks of varying resistance causes the coastline to be eroded irregularly. This is particularly pronounced where hard rocks, example granites and limestones occur in alternate bands with softer rocks, example sand and clay. The softer rocks are worn back into inlets, coves or bays and the harder ones persist as headlands, promote trees or capes. 
along the Dorset coast of southern England, Swanes Bay and Durston Head are examples. Even where the coast is of one rock type, irregularities will be caused by variation within the rock. The Spenang Island, made of granite, has many bays and headlands. Very large indentations such as the Persian Gulf or the Bay of Bengal are due to other causes such as submergence or earth movement. The second one is cliffs and wave cut platforms. Generally, any very steep rock face adjoining the coast forms a cliff. The rate of recession will depend on its geological structure, that is the stratification and jointing of the rocks and their resistance to wave attack. If the beds deep seawards, large blocks of rock will be dislodged and fall into the sea. The cliff will rise in a series of steps as shown in figure 7-5. On the contrary, if the beds deep landwards as illustrated in figure, the cliff will be more resistant to wave erosion. Some of the best known cliffs are the chalk cliffs of the English Channel and include Beachy Head which is 500 feet high, the Seven Sisters near the mouth of the Cook Mere and the White Cliffs of Dover. At the base of the cliff, the sea cuts a notch which gradually undermines the cliff so that it collapses. As a cliff recedes landwards under the pounding of waves, an eroded base is left behind called a wave cut platform. The platform, the upper part of which is exposed at low tide, slopes gently seawards and its surface is strewn with rock debris from the receding cliff. Further abrasion continues until the pebbles are swept away into the sea. The eroded materials are deposited on the offshore terrace. When the platform attains a greater width, miles in the case of the wave cut platform of strand flat of western Norway, it is entirely covered with water and further erosion of the cliffs is negligible. The third one is cave, arc, stack and stump. Prolonged wave attack on the base of a cliff excavates holes in regions of local weakness called caves. Example at Flamborough Head, England. When two caves approach one another form either side of a headland and unite they form an arc. Example the Niddle Eye near Wick, Scotland for the erosion by waves until will ultimately lead to the total collapse of the arc. The seaward portion of the headland will remain as a pillar of rock known as a stack. One of the finest examples of a stack is the old man of Hoy in the Orkneys, which is of old red sandstone and is 450 feet high, equally out. Standing are the needles, isolate of white, which are a group of stacks cut in chalk and diminishing in size seawards. In the course of time, these stubborn stacks will gradually be removed. The vertical rock pillars are eroded, leaving behind only the stumps which are only just visible above the sea level. Example, those of the Sant Kilda group of the Outer Hebrides, Scotland. The fourth one is Geoge and Globs. The occasional splashing of the waves against the roof of a cave may enlarge the joints when compressed air is trapped inside. A natural shaft is thus formed which may eventually pierce through to the surface. Waves breaking into the cave may force water or spray or just air out of this hole. Such a shaft is termed a glaub from the noise made by the water gurgling inside or blow hole. An example is at Holborn Head in Kaithness, Scotland. The enlargement of blow holes and the continued action of waves weakens the cave roof and the roof collapses along a narrow inlet or creek develops. Such deep clefts, which may be 100 feet deep and equally long, are called geos. Example, the white geo near Duncansby Head, Scotland. Now, we are going to read coastal features of deposition. The first one is beaches. Sands and gravels loosened from the land are moved by waves to be deposited along the shore as beaches. This is the most dominant form of the constructive work of the sea. The eroded material is transported along the shore in several distinct ways. The longshore drift, which comes obliquely to the coast, carries the material along the shore in the direction of the dominant wind. At the same time, the backwash removes part of the maternal seawards along the bed of the sea and deposits it on the offshore terrace and even beyond finer materials such as silt and mud are deposited in the shallow waters of the sheltered coast. The constant action of the waves automatically sorts out the shoreline deposits in a graded manner. 
the coats and materials cobbles and boulders are dropped by the waves at the top of the beach the finer materials pebbles and sand grains which are carried down the beach by the backwash are dropped closer to the sea on smooth lowlands beaches may continue for miles like those of the east coast of west malaysia but in upland regions where the land descends abruptly into the sea such as the chilean coast long beaches are absent the second one is spits and bars the debris eroded by waves is continually moved by a long shore drift and where there is an indentation in the coast such as the mouth of a river or a bay material may continue to be deposited across the inlet as more material are added they will pile up on into a ridge or embankment of shingle forming a tongue or spit with one end attached to the land and the other end projecting into the sea example cash shot spit southampton water in land or those along the coast of kelantan oblique waves may curve the spit into a hook or recurved spit when the ridge of shingle is formed across the mouth of a river or the entrance to a bay it is called a bar the most remarkable example of a bar is chesil beach in dorset in land which extends for over 16 miles along the coast linking the isle of portland with mainland and enclosing a lagoon called the fleet such a connecting bar that joins two land masses is better known as tombolo on the baltic coast of poland and germany large bodies of water are almost completely enclosed by long bars locally termed nehrungs to form marshy lagoons or halves the third one is marine dunes and dune belts with the force of onshore winds a large amount of coastal sand is driven landwards forming extensive marine dunes that stretch into dune belts their advance inland may engulf farms roads and even entire villages the dunes of the lands southwest france cover 6000 square miles the crest of the dunes are over 130 130 feet high dunes are common in the coast lands of belgium denmark and the netherlands to arrest the migration of the dunes and binding a species of grass and shrubs such as marram grass and pines are planted now we are going to read types of coasts despite a great variety of coastal features coast lines may be divided into two basic types but the first one is coast lines of submergence these are due to the sinking of the land or the rise of the sea including such coasts such as coast flood coast estuarine coast and dalmatian or languedocian coasts the second one is coast lines of emergence these are due to the uplift of the land or a fall in the sea level they are less common and are represented by the uplifted lowland coast and the emergent upland coast coast lines of submergence the first one is ria coast during the ice age a great deal of water was locked up in ice The warmer climate that followed melted much of the ice. Subsequently, there was an increase in the waters of the oceans, and the sea level rose appreciably. In some cases, it is estimated that there was a rise of almost 300 feet. In upland coastal regions, where the mountains run at right angles to the sea, that is transverse or discordant to the coast, the rise in the sea level submerges or drowns the lower parts of the valleys to form long, narrow, branching inlets separated by narrow headlands. They differ from floods. in two important respects that is they are not glaciated and the depth increases seawards a ria coast is typical of the atlantic type of coast like those of northwest france northwest spain northwest spain southwest ireland devon and cornwall as rias are generally backed by high land they support few large commercial ports through the though they have deep water and offer sheltered anchorages they have been extensively used for setting fishing ports and naval bases such as plymouth and brest the second one is fire coasts fires are submerged u shaped glacial troughs they mark the paths of glaciers that plunged down from the highlands they have steep walls often rising straight from the sea with tributary branches joining the main inlet at right angles due to the greater intensity of ice erosion fjords are deep for great distances in land but there is a shallow section at the seaward end formed by a ridge of rock and called the threshold of the fire coast are 
numerous islands or skerries which with the shallow thresholds sometimes only 200 feet deep complicate coastal navigation fired coasts are almost entirely confined to the higher latitudes of the temperate regions which were once glaciated example norway alaska british columbia southern chile and the south island of new zealand some of the large fires are extremely long and deep for example the sogne fire of norway is 110 miles long 4 miles wide and almost 4000 feet deep in its mid channel despite their deep and sheltered water few large ports are located in fires their mountainous background with poor accessibility inland attract few settlements agriculture is confined to the deltaic fans built up where streams flow down to the fires the few towns that exist either as fishing or market centers example trondheim are only of local importance the third one is dalmatian coast this is the longitudinal coast where mountains run parallel or concordant to the coast the name is taken from the coast of dalmatia yugoslavia along the adriatic sea where the submergence of coast line produces long narrow inlets with a chain of islands parallel to the coast the elongated islands are the crest of former ranges and the narrow sounds were the former longitudinal valleys the dalmatian type of coast is also typical of the pacific coast where the ranges are parallel to the coast example western coast of north and south america but there the coast line is more regular like the ria and fire coast the mountainous nature of the dalmatian coast line hinders communication inland it has deep sheltered harbors but no distinguished ports on the pacific coast however there are some important ports such as san francisco the fourth one is estuarine coast in submerged lowlands the mouths of rivers are drowned so that funnel shaped estuaries are formed if their entrances are not silted by moving sand banks they make excellent sites for ports example the estuaries of the thames elbe and plate are the sites of such great seaports as london hamburg and buenos aires tidal effects further enhance the value of the ports and even when there is a little silting modern bridges help to keep the ports open all the time now we are going to read coast lines of emergence the first one is uplifted lowland coast the uplift of part of the continental shelf produces a smooth gently sloping coastal lowland the offshore waters are shallow with lagoons salt marshes and mud flats where the emergent deposits from the continental shelves are sandy and gravelly beaches and marine dunes are formed ports that were once located on the former coast become inland towns examples of uplifted lowland coasts include the southeastern usa western finland eastern sweden and parts of coastal argentina south of the rio de la plata second one is emergent upland coast faulting and earth movement may thrust up coastal plateau so that the whole region is raised with consequent emergent features a raised beach is the most prominent the raised beach is beyond the reach of the waves though it may still possess arcs stacks and other coastal features the emergent upland coast is quite straight with steep cliffs and deeper offshore water for the waves have not yet eroded lines of weakness or carved a wave cut platform it has little potential for good port sites examples of emergent upland coasts are found in scotland the western coast of the deccan india and the western arabian coast facing the red sea so with this our chapter ends in the next video we will read the next chapter so friend subscribe the channel to listen to all the audiobooks thank you